Welcome to this module, Professor Messer's free CompTIA A Plus certification training course. And this module is a history of central processing units. We're going to go through a summary of what we might look to expect on the Essentials Exam 220-601. Section 1.1 describes our requirement of understanding the purposes and characteristics of processors and CPUs. And it specifically even spells out AMD and Intel CPUs. So it's going to be important that we understand the history and understand the capabilities of those types of processing units. So we're going to talk about the industry itself. We're going to talk a lot about Intel and we're going to talk a lot about AMD. We'll also talk about the history of 32-bit CPUs. We'll talk about how 64-bit central processing units work today. And we'll also describe what this latest generation of CPUs brings to the table. Now, the CPU industry itself is in constant change. And a lot of this change comes from way back in 1965. A gentleman by the name of Gordon Moore, who happened to be a co-founder of Intel, he had a published article in Electronics Magazine. And he said the number of transistors on a chip is going to double about every two years. And that was something to say back in 1965. But interestingly enough, about every two years, Sure enough, the number of transistors on a chip has doubled. So you can imagine the number of technological leaps that these companies have had to make to stay up with that. But they're keeping pretty good pace there. Now we're over 40 years after that. And we've consistently, about every two years, doubled the number of transistors. So today, they're, during those 42 uh, 40 plus years later, now we've had a number of companies come and go in the processor market. Today, the only two you're really going to find way out in front with the personal computer processors anyway is Intel and AMD. So we'll talk a lot about how those processors apply to what we see happening today. A good place to start with 32-bit CPUs is with the Pentium. The Pentium was introduced in 1993, and it has a form factor that used pin grid arrays, PGAs. Those pin grid array sockets uh, for the Pentium throughout its lifetime, there were a number of different Pentium models. So you may see some work in socket 4 and others work in socket 5. The speed of the Pentium, uh, as we think about speeds, that's how most of these chips were, uh, were analyzed for performance back then, ran everywhere from 60 megahertz all the way up to 300 megahertz. And what was interesting about the Pentium is that it introduced a very wide data bus of 64 bits. It also introduced something called a superscalar architecture. And what this is is a pipeline of instructions. Prior to the Pentium, the way that CPUs would work is they'd perform an instruction, and then they would process the next instruction one at a time. What a superscalar architecture did was line up the different instructions so that you could slide them through the processor one after the other after the other. Previous versions performed an instruction and then had to gather memory and had to gather instruction pieces and had to gather data before it could really perform the next instruction. So instead of having to wait all of that time to have the instructions take place, it essentially just lined them up and was able to perform one after the other, which greatly improved the efficiency of these chips. This was also the very first time we started to see the multimedia instruction set called MMX. So as we started seeing more audio and more video emerge, the Pentium was the first chip that took advantage of that. A competitor to the Pentium was called the AMD K5. And this was introduced about the 1996 time frame. This was also a PGA style chip. And it, it used something called socket 5 and socket 7. You may be asked about sockets and the way that these chips fit on your A plus exam. Uh, the, this chip itself ran about the same type of speeds as the Pentium did. This one was a little bit faster, 75 megahertz to 133. But what we started to find is that the Intel architectures and the AMD architectures had different performance, even though the, the clock speeds were very similar. Because the internals of the chips started getting these new technologies, like the superscalar architecture and the MMX instruction set. This particular chip, though, was pin compatible with the Pentium. So this was a very high performance chip. And many people use this chip on their motherboard instead of a Pentium because of a cost savings associated with it. The next step for processors was Intel's Pentium Pro. In 1995, this PGA-style chip that used socket 8 was introduced. 
And it got a little bit faster. You can see these speeds of the clock are increasing a little bit, 150 through 200 megahertz with the different models of the Pentium Pro. It wasn't around very long, but it introduced additional pipelines. So not only did we have a superscalar architecture similar to the Pentium, but there were multiple pipelines lining information up so that we could even process information even faster. This was also the introduction of the L2 cache of a CPU being on the chip itself, on package, as we like to call it. And it also allowed us, because we had all of these superscalar architectures and caches, this chip also introduced the idea of performing out-of-order executions. As the chip needed to gather information to perform calculations, it may receive some information prior to receiving uh, the, the initial information, and it would perform calculations out of order, which was very different for chips at this time frame. But now we're starting to see how these multiple efficiencies in chips were beginning to change the way that these chip performances were overall. The Pentium 2 came out soon after that. This was a single edge cartridge. So this was a bit of a departure from the traditional Pentiums with their PGA style. And it used something called slot 1. The speeds of the Pentium 2 really ranged uh, very broadly between 233 megahertz and 450 megahertz. And this was a very different change, not just in the packaging, but this was more of a consumer style chip. Whereas the Pentium Pro didn't last very longer on the consumer side, the Pentium 2 was very heavily marketed on the consumer market. And so we saw a lot of Pentium 2 systems, especially with their MMX edition, because more people were starting to do audio and video and more multimedia capabilities in their personal computers at home. AMD came out with a competitor along that time frame that competed directly with the Pentium 2, and it was called the AMD K6. This was 1997, and it still had a PGA architecture here. You can see it's socket 7 is what it used. And the speeds of this, of this chip were about the same speeds of the Pentium 2, 166 megahertz through 300 megahertz. Now, just as as Intel introduced a very specialized MMX instruction set for multimedia, AMD also came out with a specialized instruction set for multimedia called 3D Now. This was more for doing graphical type capabilities too. So the gaming market you'll find really drives a lot of the things that happen with CPUs. And the 3D Now instruction set allowed a lot more capabilities on the graphical side. And so you'll see these specialized instruction sets are now becoming a very big part of the chips. And they continue to be. As we go through this, you find that a lot of efficiency comes from having those instruction sets. The next chip that came along was the Celeron. The Celeron name even exists today. Celeron is a brand name from Intel that doesn't talk about a specific chip, but really talks about a performance that you can expect to get from your chips. The first time we saw this was with the Pentium 2. And this is something you could think of as a value line. This is the chips that you might want to have if you need a system that doesn't need a lot of processing power, but still needs to be relatively functional. So there were Pentium 3 versions of this, Pentium 4 versions of this, even up to today where you have a, an Intel Core 2 Duo Celeron style chip. Uh, back during the Pentium 2 days, this Celeron chip had the same style and look as the Pentium 2 chip. But a number of things were, were less efficient than the traditional Pentium 2. But that also meant that the chip wasn't as expensive. And so there's a cost benefit associated with that as well. The Pentium 3 came out soon after that in 1999. The Pentium 3 had a lot of different styles in its packaging. It had that single edge card. It also had a PGA type uh, packaging. That's what we're seeing here with the Pentium 3. And we're still now starting to get in some very high clock speeds with the 450 megahertz finally hitting into that 1.4 gigahertz clock speeds with some models of the Pentium 3. What was a unique feature of this chip is that it introduced a very high speed L2 cache. And so it was able to do even more processes even faster. The processing improvements inside the chip itself also took it to the next level. The, the L2 cache really needed to be faster because the chip itself was a lot more functional, a lot more efficient. And we were seeing some very, very large improvements in processing power with the introduction of the Pentium 3. The AMD Athlon came about that same time frame, 1999. It had this classic style, what they called a classic one, which used the slot A. And there was also a model of Pentium called a Thunderbird. 
This is something you're going to start to see when you look at chipsets. And this is about the time frame as these names of chipsets started to come out. Because you saw there was a, a Pentium 3, and there's a lot of different models of Pentium 3. And the different models introduce different technologies. So as companies introduce new, new models of chips, what you're going to find is there's a code name associated with those. And the code name tends to stick to the chip all the way through its life cycle. And so there was not just this classic uh, Athlon chip. There was also a Thunderbird model that had a PGA style. So you'll see these odd names pop up. This one happened to run. The AMD Athlon ran from 500 megahertz all the way up to 233 giga, 2.33 gigahertz in its Thunderbird models. It had a very interesting caching style that increased performance, and it had an enhanced version of the instruction set for graphics. Its 3D now was improved to do, to handle even higher end graphics. The AMD Duron was introduced right after that that not only introduced new speeds, but it had some real changes with the way the caching was done. And that's because it introduced higher performance. It had higher speed processors. And what was interesting about this is it had a smaller L2 cache, but it increased the size of the L1 cache. And that's because these processors were just so fast and were performing so well, they needed a larger L1 cache. What was interesting about this line, though, is you could take out a slower AMD Duron and introduce a higher speed version of it. And it used exactly the same speed of front side bus, which made it very upgradable. This was a very big competitive advantage that AMD had, is you could go from 600 megahertz almost all the way up to 1.8 gigahertz without changing your motherboard. You could essentially take a CPU chip out and put in a new chip. Now, obviously, there are some advantages and disadvantages to doing that. But the upgradability in itself with just the CPU was a big advantage that AMD had with this Duron line. The Pentium 4 came out right after that in the, about the year 2000. It definitely is PGA. And I put a number of the different models of Pentium 4 here, these different code names of Williamette and Prescott and Cedar Mill. You're going to see those names written down with the Pentium 4 because there were so many different models of the P4 that came out. It ran from 1.3 gigahertz through 3.8 gigahertz. And it had a redesigned architecture that was named NetBurst. What that allowed to do, it allowed it to do is have an extremely deep and very wide pipeline. So it was able to send instructions through the CPU at a very high rate of speed. Combined with that, it had increased clock speed. So not only were you passing more instructions through the CPU, you were doing a lot more of them at the same time. So that having that, that architecture available really extended the capabilities of our processing power. And that was a pretty good reason why so many different models of the Pentium 4 came out. That particular style of chip and the architecture had a great deal of longevity. Competing with that was the AMD Athlon XP. And this XP had these different uh, code names, Palomino, Thoroughbred, Barton, Thornton. You, the AMD Athlon XP was also had uh, that upgradability aspect to it that the Duron had. What you also see here is they also, AMD also increased the bus speeds along with Intel at the same time. There was quite a bit of fighting now going on, very competitive in these two markets during this time frame. What was interesting about the XP is it had a lower voltage requirement, which allowed them to work in different motherboards, definitely smaller motherboards with smaller environments, even in laptop environments as well. So having that lower voltage extended the capabilities of the processor through many different types of systems, not just server and desktop, but also the laptop systems. Intel introduced something called the Xeon processor. In, and it really did that back in the P2 and P3 days. But this is really where they caught stride, was about the 2001 time frame. This is a high-end processor line. We talked about the Intel Celeron as being the value line. We know that the Intel Xeon, even to this day, is considered the high-end processor line. So if you have a file server, an application server, a server that's performing a lot of functions and handling uh, information for a lot of people, you'll see a number of these processors, like the 3000 series, the 5000 series series. This is about the time frame where you start to see the departure of the processing clock speeds, and you see more of these model names associated with this. This particular processor was really designed for systems that had multiple CPUs in it. So if you had a server that had a dual or quad processor system, these were the types of processors you'd put into those servers to get the maximum amount of performance out of them. 
it was in 2001 where we really started to see 64-bit CPUs really come of age. And uh, the Intel brand of Itanium refers to Intel's line of 64-bit, a high-end line of 64-bit CPUs. The Itanium, when it came out, used this PGA cartridge, a pin array cartridge, which if you look at the bottom, looks very similar to a PGA chip. But you can see it's on a little bit longer platform. So it's a little bit different than the style that was there in the past. What was different about this very high-end 64-bit chip is it used these features called branch predication, speculative execution, and branch prediction. Now, branch predication and speculative execution were used as the as uh, instructions came through. The chip would decide how many different ways you could go with making a particular transaction. And it, before it got the last piece of information, it had already determined what all of the different outcomes might be. And when it finally got the last piece of information, it had already calculated the piece out and could continue on its way. All of those other calculations that were done that it didn't follow, it just threw them away. And that's the speculative execution piece of this. It just threw away the things that it didn't need. The other piece that was interesting was this branch prediction. The chip had built into the hardware a way that it could predict which way most of the time you'd be going with a particular function. And it calculated those first so that when you finally got that piece of information, it was assured that most of the time it knew the direction you were going to go. And it could have already predicted that piece. And again, throwing away the things that it didn't need after the fact. This was a very different way of looking at processing power inside a CPU. So obviously, the 64-bit arena was one that was extremely competitive and demanded a lot of performance from these chips. AMD also introduced a 64-bit processor called the Opteron. And that was the brand that they assigned to their 64-bit line of CPUs. You can see the Micro PGA was the style used for this particular chip. There were a number of different models introduced for this, uh, a dual core, a quad core model. But what was interesting about this chip is as AMD moved from uh, the, into this 64-bit world, they created a chip that very efficiently would also execute 32-bit applications. This was really important as the industry has been making this transition from 32-bit to 64-bit that the CPUs would be able to do this. At this point, Intel's technology couldn't do this at very high speeds. There was a speed problem that they had associated with it. It had to slow down to perform 32-bit calculations. AMD's chip, the Opteron, did not. So this positioned them very well in this world. And it, it natively executed 64-bit applications at the same time. So a very powerful chip from AMD's perspective. Today, the latest generation of CPUs is really positioned well for both AMD and for Intel. AMD has a number of high-end server and workstation lines that they continue to sell with that Opteron brand we were just talking about on the 64-bit side. On the workstation side, we, there's a quad-core line called Phenom. The Athlon continues to be a powerful brand for them with their dual-core, quad-core, 32-bit, 64-bit. It is the workhorse of AMD and what they're doing today. And there's the Simpron line that is that value line. It's the everyday computing you might see from AMD that has a nice price point associated with it. On the mobile side, laptops tend to use a line from AMD called the Turon. And if you see that, it's usually a lower voltage CPU that's going to run very cool inside the laptop performing systems. Intel has also similar lines available that they're offering on this Celeron continues to be a very strong brand name. And that's the one people think about when they think about that value line of processors. On the workstation side, we continue to see Pentium. But these days, that Intel Core line, especially the Core Duo and the Core 2 line, is extremely popular. And the Centrino line is also one that we'll see a lot in mobile technologies that brings a number of those architectures into the lower voltages that you need in a laptop environment. On the server line, you continue to see the Xeons, especially the multiprocessor, and the Itanium for the high-end 64-bit processing that you need on a server environment. In review, we have gone through very quickly a history of what's happened in the industry with Intel and with AMD. We've not only seen where we've come from a 32-bit perspective, but we've also seen what's happening today with our 64-bit line of processors and where they're going. And the latest generation continues to build on that with multiple cores and different platforms and architectures for laptop and for value line CPUs as well.
to comment on this video or to watch any of our free A plus videos to participate in our message boards or maybe add something to our study guide wiki, feel free to visit our website at freeaplus.com.